Darren, great to have you today on the Remote Work Live podcast. I've got Darren Chait with me. He is a co-founder of a really interesting piece of, of software, you know, because I tell you why, it's, it's the kind of software that you think to yourself, why didn't I think of that? Why did <laughs> why did not I not think of that idea? Because you know when you're you're working and you're using all these different applications, and by the way, the, the software is called Hugo. When you're using all these applications, you're using Slack, you're using um, Salesforce, you're using HubSpot, and you've got like things here, there, and everywhere. You're probably writing notes with your pen. You're probably <laughs> doing audio at the same time. And Hugo is something that it's like a light bulb goes in your head where you think, yeah, this is this can integrate all of my meeting notes in one place. And got it. it's just a great piece of software. And I'm, you know, I'm going to start using it now myself because I, I have a lot of meetings. I use a lot of these applications. So, Darren, I, first of all, I wanted to welcome you here and uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Alex. Likewise, great to be on the show. And uh, I think you did a much better job there than I could have done. So appreciate <laughs> <laughs> the quick overview of Hugo too. Well, you know, I want, I want you to talk about it as well because it's something I think that... Um, the listeners, whether you're, you know, whether you're a sole opener, whether you're, you have a business, if you're looking as, as, a, as a manager or as a CEO to, to kind of get your team all together in terms of the communication, I think it's something that can really cover a lot of different bases. So I think obviously you're the best person to, uh, to tell us all about, uh, about Hugo and how it all came about. But first and foremost, I'm interested to hear more about you because you're, yeah, just tell, tell us about you and how it all got started. Sure. Yeah, totally. So as you can probably hear, I've got a different accent again. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like everyone you have on the show is a slightly different one. But uh, I'm originally Australian. I'm from Sydney, Australia, um, and I uh, grew up in Sydney and I actually was a corporate lawyer. Um, at, that's how I started my career, worked for a big law firm, those crazy hours, suited up every morning and went to go and build my time in six minute increments to work on something that it's probably so inconsequential and so insignificant, um, but making lots of money for, for other people. And uh, one, one of the big frustrations there was around meetings, and that was the sort of genesis of Hugo. Um, but the more interesting, um, I guess, reason why I, I, I left the law and, and found a co-founded Hugo um, was the, the excitement of building something that can create value when you're not working. Mm -hmm. So the thing about lawyers, right, is you build your time. So if I'm sitting doing some work for you on the clock and I do an hour of work, you'll get a bill for an hour of time. I then head home, I head on vacation. I can't create any more value from you unless I'm sitting at my desk. But on the other hand, um, many businesses, software especially, I can wake up in the morning and have a thousand new customers um, or I can I can hear from a customer who, you know, who's in a completely different time zone, like in the UK, and, uh, and they've been getting value out of something I've built while I've been on holiday or mm -hmm. while I've been asleep. And that there's something about that that really got my attention and really got me excited. So I teamed up with a, an old friend who I'd done some work with before. Um, we co-founded Hugo and decided to flip up and move to the Bay Area, to San Francisco, California, to, to build the business. Um, but uh, very quickly, and we'll talk a lot about remote, we realized that that's not the best way anymore to build a business. And why did you choose, I mean, this might be a, a dumb question, or I don't know, but why did you choose uh, the particular part of the world that you're in right now? Yeah, I, th I think um, going back a few years already, um, there's obviously, it, you know, there's a reputation being in Silicon Valley um, in the Bay Area where a lot of innovative tech is, is, is produced. And coming from Australia, we thought that we needed access to great talent, great investors, um, and to be on the, you know, the doorsteps of our partners and competitors. Um, so that's why. And there is a lot of great talent here in the Bay Area. What we didn't realize early on was that we could also access talent in other places without being headquartered there, too. And that was a real um, new, new idea for us, which sounds so ridiculousness in retrospect. But uh, that's uh, we didn't know that at the time. So we, we found it here, started hiring here initially. OK, so the evolution came about because of your your, you know, your need and your want to access talent wherever they may be in the world, right? Exactly, exactly. And so right now you describe yourself as a, as a fully remote team, I would say, right? Or a fully remote business? Or do you still hire people locally to you? Have a, you know, you're fully decentralized, sure. aren't you? 
Uh, basically, there's there's three of us here in San Francisco, um, and the rest of the team are, are, de- are completely decentralized. So around the US and parts of South America as well. Mm-hmm. And what would you say? I mean, for me, remote work has just liberated me, um, and a lot of people I speak to have a similar sort of um, similar sort of feeling, I guess. But what effect has it had on your life? Yeah. So interesting. So uh, there's, I mean, there's so many ways to look at it. There's the obvious, right? If you don't work remote, there's the bit that everyone gets, which is obviously there's some bit of flexibility. There's easier ways to achieve balance, perhaps. Um, there are risks too, of course, but you know, having access to family and working, um, you know, more fluid schedules and things like that. They're the, they're the obvious things. What I guess is more interesting about remote is the access to even better people wherever they are. So if you think about when you're trying to collaborate with someone, whether you're trying to hire them, enter into a partnership deal, even sell to a customer, you have a natural funnel based on geography. Um, If I want to hire a software engineer with these skills, normally going back a decade is San Francisco is the stopping point. How many are there in San Francisco? How many people are willing to commute to where our office is and work those hours? And all of a sudden I'm left with this pool to hire from. All of a sudden, same goes for partners, consultants, contractors, you name it. Right now with remote, it that that just doesn't exist. I have the entire world's population. So that so that's that's one. Um, that having access to everyone in the world is incredible. Um, and and two, the the diversity um, is 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 really interesting. And I know I, want, I really want to talk a bit about diversity um, today as well. But Excellent. diversity is, is is incredibly important for lots of reasons. But number one uh, is diversity of perspective. If I hire a bunch of software engineers from San Francisco, they're all the same. They've come from the same sort of schools. In many cases, similar you know racial, social economic, um, gender backgrounds. Um, that that for me is is means it's not only boring and sad that, that that I'm surrounded by a team like that. I'm losing very different perspectives. Um, whereas when I hire people from all over the world, we have people from all walks of life and all different backgrounds, and the ideas they contribute, the work they do, takes that into account. It means they they're contributing a completely diverse perspective, different to mine, and different to my co-founder, and different to everyone else on the team. And that for me is an opportunity unlocked by remote. Oh, that's great, and it's it's refreshing to hear to hear that. Uh, and I think, yeah, diversity is something that's really um, you know really important to me as well, and really something that we try to push here at Remote Work Live. So it's really great to, to to have you talk about that too. And so your your team is all over the world. Where where are they? Where are they based? Where are they? Sure. Yeah. So um, pr- around around the US um, and through South America, so all the way through Brazil, particularly, um, that's where a lot of our engineering talent comes from. Excellent, excellent. And so, and like I said at the top of the show, Hugo is just such a just such a wonderful wonderful tool. And and again, another reason I want I wanted uh, to have you on as well, Darren, is because there I think there's some. You're an unsung hero in many ways in terms of uh, remote. And I think there are certain tools that, and I think in a way we have a, a similar sort of outlook on, on tech and software that it's built to make people's lives easier. Um, it's built to, uh, you, know, you know, it's one of this kind of business that, like you said, it, you can, it, it can be working for you even when you're, a, you're, you're asleep. So mm-hmm. I, I think, Tell us a, a bit more in your own words about Hugo, how it's all, you know, how it's all put together and come about. Sure, totally. So Hugo today, we call it connected meeting notes software. Uh, what that means is centralized searchable meeting notes and agendas built on top of your calendar. So we automatically organize all your notes and agendas by the contacts and companies you meet. So next time Alex and I catch up, notes from our discussion today are resurfaced and available to anyone else on my team and connect it to all of your tools. So as I'm writing my meeting notes, the insights get pushed out via Slack. So people who are in the room know we sync with your CRM. We'll create the actions as tasks, issues, and tickets in your project management tools. Uh, we'll link the recording from your Zoom call right to your meeting notes. So my entire software stack um, and my entire team are on the same page with, with our meetings. And uh, to be honest, the vision we had actually wasn't exactly like this. We knew meetings were had, you know, were, were had a, there was a big opportunity with meetings. Um, so much has changed about the way we work. Remote, definitely number one. But mm-hmm. as we know, looking back uh, even five, ten years, the way we worked was so different. But the way we meet hadn't changed. Yeah, we've got video now and the Skypes and Zooms and Blue Jeans of the world is great. But we still need to be in the room. 
a room to have that conversation. Our colleagues who aren't sitting here right now don't have the value of this conversation. And we're using, you know, on average 130 different SaaS tools in enterprise, all disconnected from the meeting. So we knew the, the opportunity was exciting to us, but we tried to solve it in a really different way um, with a mobile first app, actually. And uh, Josh, my co-founder, and I spent a lot of our day out on the road talking to customers, talking to partners, talking to investors, running around town on video calls. And uh, we'd, we'd, we'd catch up with the team at the end of the day, and the team were just so disconnected. I tried to say, you know, yes, Alex had this great idea, and that customer didn't like this, and that partner's really interested on that. But there was just this disconnect where they just didn't get what I was saying because everything had to come through me. So we built for ourselves a Slack plugin that would integrate with my calendar and, and ping me after every meeting that was in my Google Calendar and say, hey, I saw you just met Alex. What happened? And I'd reply to the Slack message saying, good chat with Alex. We discussed this. We discussed that. We should do this. And it would share it with the rest of the team via Slack. Then, of course, we realized that work gets done in Trello in our case. So we added a Trello integration. And, and literally overnight, our team was transformed. We, uh, it was like everyone was in every meeting. I'd come back and it'd be like everyone had traveled with me the whole day. Um, they'd heard it all. They'd already actioned the stuff I'd heard uh, before I was even back from the meeting, before I'd even press end on the Zoom call. So that, for us, um, transformed our team to create this open, transparent, aligned, and remote-friendly business. Um, and our customers were more excited about what we were doing as a team than the product that we were working on. So that became Hugo. Um, and, that, and that's the story of how we got to Connected Meeting Note software. It's, it's, like I said, it's some of the best remote business come, come from, you know, the idea to help people to, to, to do things better, to do things more efficiently. Connectivity is such a big talking point, where, especially where remote work is concerned. And they're just like the, yeah. the, the, the market is just littered with, um, you know, great, great software. You know, there's, HubSpot's a great piece of software. Salesforce is a great piece of software. But when it comes to sort of really things that make life easier, um, I think Hugo is, is up there. And Hugo, the, I just want to let everybody know about the URL so they can go and have a look for themselves. It's hugo.team. Hugo Team. So team. So that's, that's H-U-G-O it. dot T-E-A-M. Have a look at it. Um, certainly worth considering for your team. And do you have a, a typical sort of um, customer who, who uses Hugo? Hugo? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, most of our customers are SMB or mid-market companies. Um, they're all they're all tech savvy. They 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 get software as a service. They're often using other tools like you mentioned. So the Slacks and Trellos and Jiras and HubSpots and uh, Salesforce of the world. Um, and they're very commonly B two B because B two B companies often have meetings at its core, um, both internally and with your customers. So that's sort of a typical customer for us. Well, literally the, the people who are listening to the Remote Work Life podcast. So that's, <laughs> that's useful, Good to isn't hear. it? <laughs> exactly, right, exactly. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And from this, I mean, you've built, you built a great business. You've built a great team. How, how are things now for you business-wise? How, you know, uh, are you in a growth phase? What, how are things mm -hmm. going for Hugo? Yeah, sure. Absolutely in a growth phase. Um, we that, That's what we spend most of our days focused on, growth. And growth for us means obviously new new customers, new teams using Hugo. Um, it means cut teams and companies growing, so horizontally. We obviously want to be powering the whole org. But it means something more important as well, which coming to our why, um, we're in this space where we see ourselves very much as part of the future of work. And the future of work is a buzzword that's used all the time and there's so many different aspects to it. Um, but we see Hugo as dictate as part of the part of the the, the I get the stack or the technology out there that's dictating the new way we work together uh, that enables remote teams, that allows people to make decisions in a decentralized way, um, that, that enables equity of voice where everyone can join the conversation and have access to all the information they need, even if they're not often heard in a face-to-face -face meeting or they're not asked for their opinion in the office and going to knock on the boss's door or whatever it may be. Um, so that for us is, is about growth too. Um, the thought leadership and, and really asking those questions, you know, taking a long-term view on the space and, and the role we play there. And I think, I mean, you've been going since 2014, I think it is now. So you've obviously built a, a solid foundation in order to sort of take that growth to the next, uh, to the next level. 
do you have, I mean, yeah. it's obviously evolved as well. I can actually literally see the evolution of the, from your description earlier on in terms of starting out with Slack and then incorporating other, you know, integrating other pieces in there. What, what's, what's the view? What's the, um, what does the future, do you think that looks like for, for Hugo? Sure. So um, the future for Hugo at a product level, we are very interested in the changing definition of team. So Hugo is used by teams, right, um, is, is what we've always said. And when we started, we thought a team meant colleagues, co-workers. We share a domain name. We may sit, you know, we may sit in the same office. We may be in a different time zone. It doesn't matter. Um, we work together for this company. What we've learned in 2019 and beyond is that that's not what a team is anymore. Um, I have a team with a contractor I found on Upwork that I work with every day. I have a team with an agency that does some PR work for us. I have a team with an intern who's joined us for the summer. Um, they're of different domains, different companies, part-time, full-time, casual, whatever arrangement you want to you want to you want to name. So Hugo, as team meeting note software, needs to recognize that. So we're very focused now on how do I collaborate around meetings with people in my extended team, people that I'm working with who may not be co-workers of mine? How do I share meeting insights across between companies? Um, in many cases, that actually could be a business and customer relationship where they're working, they're meeting regularly, um, and they're on a team even though one's serving the other. So um, that that's what the future of Hugo is looking like at the moment, uh, intercompany um, collaboration for this broader definition of team. And I guess the thing that is going to really the glue that sort of pulls all that together is you know, is the, is the culture of a, of a company because if you don't have the right culture, then none of that sort of collaboration, none of that, you know, that's right. um, integration exactly. is, is going to really work. And I think that's, that's I, you know, I can really feel your, uh, having looked at your book as well, I've started to read your book, 10X Culture, the four-hour uh, meeting week um, and 25 other secrets from innovative, fast-moving teams. That's something that's come about from obviously your passion of, not just Hugo, but, but teams, you know, in their overall, you know, in the overall perspective of teams. Tell, tell us a bit exactly. more about how, how the book came about and why. Yeah, sure. Um, it's funny when you talk about imposter syndrome for founders, uh, having written the book, that's probably the greatest example for me. You know, I often think like, how can we be writing a book about team culture? <laughs> and really it happened organically. Um, we, we obviously we're very involved in meeting culture specifically, um, so it's something we really care about and try and understand every day. Um, talking to customers, partners, speaking at conferences, you know, really really being strong in that space. Um, and we started keeping a bit of a running list of some of the great ideas um, that we had ourselves that we picked up from customers that partners were talking about or other authors had had written about. Um, and and really quickly, meeting culture just morphed into team culture because this is one element of it. It's much the same. Um, so we had this running list of all these amazing principles, practices, ideas, stories, um, for, and which we were using as a company ourselves to build better culture and, and build a stronger team. And we thought it was only fair to share that. Um, and that became the book. We, we, we wrote them all down. Um, we told the stories and all the ideas. And, and the, the thesis behind the book is that you can read, flick through, read all these great little ideas on a plane ride or on one afternoon, um, and then go back into your business and just try a few out. Um, it's not a, a wholesale, you know, refresh of your culture. It's why don't we try this to make decisions and why don't we meet like that? And why don't we make these small tweaks to the way we hire or the way we work promote? And that in, in, together is what's going to change your culture. And, you know, that book has come about from your, you know, your thought leadership in this, in this area of, you know, team culture. Um, what... What I don't know, because obviously you're building something successful. You build you build a successful um, team. You build a successful um, platform. But along the way, have you had any sort of learnings that you've any mistakes that you've made that you perhaps learnt from and sort of used to to really sort of um, drive forward? Plenty more, <laughs> more yeah, more more mistakes than I than I could name. Um, <laughs> So some interesting mistakes to share on the team side in particular. Um, so I obviously made a big adjustment. I came from the corporate world, very hierarchical, very old fashioned. Um, and that was my lens on leadership. 
uh, that the the partner in, in their suit who's been there for much longer than you dictates everything and this is you know young lawyers are meant to be seen and not heard and and all those sorts of you know things so um i i definitely came at it from from a different angle and uh a lot of that translated into some bad leadership decisions were made early on uh, one big mistake for example that can be summarized quite simply is thinking as a leader that the obligation the onus is on you to make the right decisions to solve problems and then uh, and guide your team. That's not the case at all. You spend so much time and money hiring great people, there's no problem with taking problems and challenges to the team and letting the best solution or the best idea surface. So we, my co-founder and I put a lot of weight on ourselves in the early days to fix everything um, and then come to the team with the magic answer to deliver the way the way out of it. Um, one, that disengages the team. And two, we're two people. Why not go and enjoy the other tens of brains that, are, that you've paid a fortune to have in the room? Um, and then we, that's really changed the way we work today. Um, you know, our problem are business problems and the team love getting involved and, and solving them. And that, again, supports the diversity argument, the diversity of perspective point I made before, too. And that, that, that is also, I mean, in reading the book, and I recommend that uh, everybody download the book. Is there, a, is there a link I can give the audience afterwards to yeah. download the book? Well, so you, sorry, it's on Amazon, or you can go to hugo.team forward slash 10x, and we've got a free ebook um, version on that site. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave that link in the show notes because it's something that awesome. whether you're, whether you're, um, you know, you're leading a business, leading a team, or even if you're going into remote business, this is something that there's certain books that you, you, you should read. Um, you know, start with why is one of them. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love that book. But Me this, too. this this book, um, I've just started reading it, but I'm I'm really captivated in terms of um, Darren's thoughts and perspectives on on culture, on on team. He mentions in the book um, the heart of a 10x team. Can you talk talk to us about that, Darren? Sure. Yeah. So the concept of a 10x team, obviously, is the team that's going to outperform all, all others. And we really try to boil it down to a few simple concepts because there's obviously so many facets and factors that make up a great team. Um, for us, um, the three concepts we came up with, with was teams that need to be adaptable, they need to be networked, and they need to be tempo-oriented. So if I just zoom into each of those briefly, Please, yeah. um, adaptable teams, um, the concept of an adaptable team uh, is a team that can that can change rapidly based on the challenge at hand. Now, that sounds pretty obvious, right? Uh, of course, that's the case. You, that, that's always what you're looking for. But really, it's a very different sort of team. You need to hire people who can can morph their skill set into the skills they require. You need to find people who are very comfortable with rapid change and, and, and uncertainty in many cases. Um, you need to find people that can change their behaviors and language based on uh, the, the environment and the people they're working with. Um, and for us, that was something we'd never expressly thought about in the early days. We didn't intentionally go out looking for adaptability, uh, but we realized very quickly that that provides us an, the advantage. And uh, in, in, you know, especially especially as an early stage company, um, you don't know what lies ahead. Uh, we're solving problems we didn't know would be problems, challenges we didn't know come up. Um, and a lot of that as well comes from another great book on the list of recommendations um, <laughs> called Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal. Um, and uh, they look a lot at a military setting for some of the most successful teams out there. And uh, he tells a story about um, – uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Boyd, um, that, who you know famously says, like he who ha can handle the quickest rate of change survives, um, and uh, you know we, we know that being innovators and entrepreneurs definitely, uh, but that's something we think about all the time. So adaptable teams are, are, are the teams that win. Um, at the same time. Uh, networked. Now, networked it means lots of things, to lots of people. We we look at it in 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 one quick way, which is. Um, Two things. One, sorry, one quick way, which I can split out. Um, the first is tools that talk. So one of the temptations in 2019 is to adopt more and more tools, more pieces of software, more place where data is, um, fragmenting um, all these insights wherever they are. Um, we only now adopt tools that connect to our existing stack. We, we're not. We don't want to be um, fulfilling this data fragmentation risk. We don't want to be fueling uh, the the fragmentation of knowledge across the business. So networked teams. Uh, are told that way. 
Um, and at the same time, the way we communicate is very much a part of being a network team. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about high bandwidth communication, mm-hmm. um, especially with remote teams, very important. Uh, but we need to communicate in a, in a, in a high bandwidth way um, as much as possible to remain networked and connected in such a tight sense. Um, so video um, and these sorts of forums rather than that quick Slack message or that WhatsApp. Um, and I'll talk about why in a moment. But very important to understand that the winning teams are consistently well networked well connected um, and and communications that bit there and the last bit um, which I think is really why we've been successful to date um, comes down to tempo so in tempo um, is very often confused with speed mm-hmm. speed is um, the the time that elapses um, for to, to, to perform something um, that, that's how that's the speed that's how fast you do something the tempo is the rate at which a movement is performed. Now, the big difference sounds like a bit of a nerdy, you know, difference uh, between the two. But what what we've learned is that everyone needs to move fast to compete. But the way we we can differentiate ourselves on high quality product, making the right decisions and doing things properly is by moving at a fast tempo, but not at a fast speed. Right. So for example, we relaunched our brand and website in a matter of days. We didn't rush through everything yeah. at all. We slowed down um, for the all the elements of design and testing and, and, and ideation. We sped up for the build and and, and the, those sorts of bits. I mean, you know, if you go and speak to a, the, the, one of the best marks, marks people in the world, you know, the most accurate, fastest shooters out there, um, and you try to race them, they'll surprise you. What they do, they don't just shoot fast to be accurate and quick. They, they pull the trigger really, really, really slowly when they're on target, and then they release really quickly. So they're spending all their time getting that, that getting that, that bullet in the middle of the target really slowly and not wasting a fraction of a second when they're rec- recovering, when the trigger's going back out for the next shot. Um, and a bit of a strange metaphor I appreciate, but um, that's how we think about things. How do we move at the fastest tempo, mm-hmm. but we don't just sprint consistently because some things need to be slowed down. Um, and that's, that's for us is the third part of a really good strong team yeah i mean it's an interesting um uh, analogy there and i think yeah you this this world of uh, not just remote work but because of technology because of your competitors because so, so many different things you have to be able to do all those things that um like darren mentioned adapting networking the, the, the tempo so it, it really makes sense and that's why i'm saying to you that check the book out because if you're looking to 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 build a successful team or to build a team that can really deliver what you're looking to to, to launch, then these are things that you should really consider. Um, and it's always good to listen to somebody like Darren, who's who's been there and he's done it. So he's been there since 2014 and he's doing it now. So and we also talked. Darren also talked about earlier on diversity and diversity of thought and. One, one thing I'll say, actually, I usually take these uh, these podcast interviews for 30 minutes, but I want to I wanna keep Darren a little bit longer if he doesn't mind, because um, <laughs> sure. there's, there's a few more questions that I, I want to ask. So I don't want to rush through this, because this is really, really important. Um, so Darren and I, we're really sort of, uh, you know, in terms of diversity, something that is really important to us. It's obviously very important to Darren and his team. I want to know from you, Darren, what, what initiatives, do you have initiatives to encourage diversity in in growing your mm-hmm. team and growing your business? Yep, absolutely. Um, so we, our view on diversity is that it's something that every business needs to think about from day one. And I think it's very tempting to leave it to in the worry about later pile. When we're the size of Google, we can go and invest in STEM education for female and non-minority genders, or you know, we can, we can hire diversity um, leadership and things like that. That's definitely the case. But it doesn't mean to say you can't do anything from day one when you make your first hire. Um, there's a very good business case for it. So when you're uh, when you're hiring for diversity, it's actually a lot easier to achieve these to to, to achieve these benefits um, to allow that to encourage that diversity of perspective, the the, the varied ideas in the room, um, the different people who are coming up with with, with very different ideas. Um, it's not something that you have to wait to your Google to, to do. Um, so specifically, there's there's a couple of things we do. Um, one is the way we hire. Um, what some of the best advice I ever got around hiring for diversity um, is actually uh, not hiring for diversity, but hiring with diversity. 
Um, and that was from Aubrey Blanche, who's the chief diversity officer at Atlassian. And she says, what you need to do is not look for people um, of a different background or, or whatever the, the, the diverse factor is that you're, tr that you're talking about, but rather make sure your pipeline um, is diverse. Whatever you need to do to have conversations with people from different backgrounds. No one's asking you to make a hire to achieve a diversity goal um, because that's not the object of diversity. Diversity is opening opening our minds up to to, to consider different ideas, um, different backgrounds, different perspectives. And you can only do that if you're talking to people from different backgrounds with different ideas and with different perspectives. So we, we do everything we can um, in, the early day, in the early stages of hiring to fill that pipeline with lots of different people. And whatever happens after that point is based on your normal recruiting processes, which of course should consider diversity. But again, no one's asking you to make a hire to tick a diversity box, um, just, just to have those conversations. The second thing is your company itself needs to be set up in the right way to achieve diversity. The right tools, for example. So, you know, you know, it's something we often hear about some of our customers and customers of other products is you can achieve diversity by by enabling communication through different forums or channels. So, you, you know, we often see um, certain people of, of, of specific backgrounds or certain backgrounds um, aren't heard as well in meetings because they don't they don't speak up perhaps other people talk over them they don't ask them for their opinions so if all your decisions are made and all your discussion occurs in meetings you're going to completely wipe out that all that diversity and all those great ideas um, so what about other channels can they slack can they use slack to chat can they comment on a meeting note in Hugo can they uh, add, add to the specification for the work in your project management tool can they record a quick video um, asynchronously, asynchronously where they can share their ideas and what they're passionate about, which they didn't feel comfortable knocking on your door about or raising in a meeting. You need the tools to enable diversity. So that hiring approach and that tooling approach is how we've done it at Hugo. Great. All great um, ideas there. And I think particularly that perspective from last year, now, I'm going to look at that actually because it's something that I'd not, I'd not come across myself. So Certainly worth looking at. Certainly worth considering um, yourself if you're if you're looking to if you're just starting out or if you're building your team. If you're at a, pro, a stage that Darren is at, at the moment, and Darren is what I mean. Another, it's not hiring is is really it's not an easy thing to do at all, is it? It's, it's a difficult <laughs> no, thing to do. No, that's for sure. You know? Absolutely. And one common thread that has, um, has has cropped up in each conversation that I've had is that. Uh, when when people are approaching hiring managers or leaders of business, they they tend to lead with the skills that they have, and they say how good they are at this, that, and the other. But and they fail to sort of talk about things like you know their values, you know how they can really connect with the business, the mission, etc. How do you identify? You know how do you sort of separate those people in your process? How do you identify the people who are I guess values aligned in many ways. Yeah. Not easy. So it's really difficult. Really difficult. Yeah. It's much easier to assess technical skill or look yeah. at someone's work than it is. But that's actually less important because values are something that don't change very rapidly. Skills do. I can teach you things or I can help you learn things. Um, so the way we do that at Hugo is actually just talk about them. So right early on, that's the conversation we're having. We're having cultural interviews that are, that are actually centered around values. So we will raise that with you and say, this is really important to us. We care a lot about diversity. Let's chat about diversity diversity for 10 minutes. Um, talk to me about how you felt in another organization uh, in this context. Who's done it well? Who hasn't? Why? How would you solve for that? Um, that's a value and we've had a really deep conversation about it and I can see if, you, if, if that's something that excites you or, or scares you, if that's something you add value or detract value. So I think that's one. Um, the other thing we do heavily is we we rely on great content out there. So we send a lot of our candidates and every hire books to read. Um, and why? One is obviously educating them and opening their eyes up to things we care about, the values we share. Uh, but it's also letting them know what's important to us. So the this type of books that we send them and the things that they read and during the hiring process is a great indicator for them of what we care about, who we subscribe to, and what's and what matters. Um, and that's another good way. It's very polarizing. We see people who come back and a little bit don't quite get why we like that book, why we shared that author. Others come back of jumping, you know, off the table, so excited about uh, how how similarly our, you know, so we view things. So that's another great way that's worked for us in making sure there's good value and culture fit. Nice, I like that. 
and that's very similar actually to um, I interviewed Eric Ryan from Method uh, Method Products a few few years ago, and they they have their own book, but they also encourage people who are potentially coming in for an interview to to do basically do some homework. They give them homework to do, mm. and that, a lot of that homework involves involves reading and. And it kind of eliminates yeah. those people in, in in one way who you know either can't be bothered or at least when they get to the interview stage or the face to face stage, you can understand if there are if it sort of lit them up or if it kind of really sort exactly. of you know really poured water on things sort of thing you know so exactly exactly that's it great ideas there and uh, so they're so they're in your team now they're they're there they're they're they're, they're active and you talk about um, cultivating that that shared consciousness within within your within your team in the, in the book and um if you if you uh want to check out the book i think as as i said at the beginning i'm going to leave a link to the book the book is called uh, 10x culture the four hour meeting week and 25 other secrets from innovative fast moving teams and part of darren's book talks about cultivating a shared uh, consciousness tell us more about that darren Yeah, that's probably one of my favorite topics actually in the book. Um, Shared consciousness is the idea that we all know how each other thinks. Um, That's a sign of any great team. And it's actually one of the biggest challenges of remote in my view, because the way, one of the the ways you can uh, achieve a shared consciousness is just by sort of um, osmosis, by being around other people, by overhearing things, by seeing them work. Mm -hmm. And of course, the way we work remotely is a little different to that. So what what we do at Hugo is a couple of things. Um, One is, I mentioned earlier, high bandwidth communication. Um, So if if you look at a spectrum of communication, one is a few words in a text message and the other is face-to-face. We now as millennials and working in 2019 in this generation default to low bandwidth. It's easier. I don't need uh, the, the social elements um, to it. I can do it asynchronously. So whenever I, I don't have to be both be available at the same time, I can message at 3 a.m. and wait till 10 a.m. for the response. Um, and there's lots of other reasons why we, we go that way. But you're missing out on a lot. Um, there's so much in your body language, in your tone, in your voice, even just being able to react to each other and seeing each other's faces um, that's lost if all your communications low bandwidth. Now, being remote and being distributed, of course, that becomes a little more difficult, but not really. So we we at Hugo have have prioritized that by using video extensively. So we we use all the tools, the Zooms, BlueJeans, Skypes of the world, um, but not only for scheduled meetings. If I want to run something by or I had an idea, I was in the shower this morning and thought of something really cool, I'll just ping you and say, hey, um, do you have a minute? Or I'll just try to call you because I want to to share what I'm passionate about. And uh, I can have a three-minute conversation like we would have at the coffee machine and if we're in the same office just via video um, and that's something we just don't do or better still time zones of course sometimes make it challenging we can do that asynchronously so at Hugo we record videos all the time all day every day there's videos flying around the, the, the place where I'll wake up in the middle of the night with a really cool idea or I want to give you feedback on your work or I want to congratulate you for something I'll send you a 5, 10, 30, 1 minute video um, where I can just talk about something, watch it in your own time, reply in your own time, but we now have this high bandwidth communication. We can be humans and that's how we can achieve a shared consciousness by getting to know each other really well, even though we may never have met. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's a good idea. I mean, I tend to, to do a lot of audio communication in that sense. So rather than typing something by email, I'm, I'm tending to, yeah. to use a, you know, a quick 20 minutes or a, a 30, sorry, not 20 minutes, 20 seconds. 20 seconds, <laughs> yeah. 20 minutes is a bit long. Um, twenty second uh, conversation and it goes backwards and forwards. It's a lot more natural, isn't yep. it, than than just, totally, just writing totally. something down. So I, I like that video. Exactly. Maybe there's an idea in that there, an app in that somewhere. Who knows? Yes, yeah, Snapchat for business. Well, there you go. Exactly, exactly. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's something that um, I, I I think it's it's a it's a great idea and it's it's something that's needed and i think lots of people are trying to really discover the best ways to to um to communicate and you know if you like you said go about the about it in a low bandwidth way then it, it becomes a bit more a bit more a bit more heavy lifting a bit a bit more hard work mm-hmm. around it doesn't it so you don't know what you don't know you don't know what you're losing right and that's the problem it seems fine i can read your message on whatsapp or slack however we're chatting but there's so much that's hidden in there that i just can't pick up um from text so you don't even know what you're missing a lot of the time exactly and 
it's all as well part of really helping because when you're working remotely you you can especially if you're new obviously there's a there's a certain aspect of feeling isolated if you're not used to it and Mm -hmm. you're just starting starting to do it so that that video interaction that face-to-face interaction can really sort of help to alleviate that you know I listen, I listen to the, the episode we're talking about loneliness and uh, that for me, uh, the v- video actually was the first thought I had um, on that topic. Oh, nice. Uh, and I think it, it's all part as well of helping you to, because if somebody's thinking about their, their loneliness or their isolation, then they're not obviously giving their best at work, are they? So exactly. you know, it's all about helping them reach their potential. And in terms of, I mean, if, if somebody worked with Hugo, what, as you know, we're getting a good idea as to how you work and your culture already. How do you help your your team, your distributed team, to achieve their potential apart from the, you know, the, the things that mm-hmm. we've mentioned? Yeah. Um, so the same way we do is if they weren't distributed, one-on-ones, regular conversations, um, high bandwidth communication, everything we've spoken about. Um, we definitely one of our values and a culture we have here is is directness and and uh, being very direct with feedback. Um, congratulations as much as criticism and, and, and being open and everyone feeling comfortable uh, to talk really openly um, and with that comes personal development um, because in the end you've got an interesting opportunity especially in a young company we're all working very hard based on a shared vision and shared mission these people are like another family to me right I see them more than I see my my kids and my wife so I'm if I'm not able to learn from them, if they can't give me that feedback and help me develop, um, I'm wasting one of the biggest opportunities I've got in my in my professional in my career, in my professional life. So we we have that we definitely have a culture where everyone is very much not only encouraged, but they they do um, takes advantage of that where where I can reach out and give someone feedback and say, I thought you could have told that story better or that was really impressive and you really motivated me or I didn't love the way you did that. And uh, doing that all the time, every day with the positive intention of personal development um, or uh, that mindset um, means that we all come out, every single one of us as as better people and and better professionals, uh, taking advantage of the opportunity we have working so closely together. No, that that is, that's great. And, that is the beauty of, of remote teams, I think. It, you, you, there's, that, there's that intention, isn't there, to really help each other out? There's that intention to, to do your best work. There's that intention to sort of really help each other to, you know, to move from, from, where, from where you are now to the next level. So, you know, that's, that's, that's wonderful, Darren. It's been really great speaking to you, actually. And there's just one nice. last question I want to ask you before we, uh, before we wrap things up. Because, and sure. I, it's a question I ask everybody. Because, I mean, I, I work in some unusual places myself. What's the most unusual place that you've worked in with Ooh. remote work? I've, uh, I've worked in the Norwegian fjords. I, uh, we, we, got, we were lucky enough to travel there a few years ago and we're literally in amongst the fjords with the, the cliffs overlooking us and, and, you know, and daylight at 4 a.m. Uh, sort of thing and was working, working with, my, with the American team um, as it was um, from there um, in one of the most incredible, beautiful places on earth. Um, but I could have been anywhere. Uh, it may, it, that, that for me was when the penny dropped, when I realized w- that it actually makes no difference um, where I am to, to achieve what we need to achieve. So that's a memory I definitely have uh, as far as exotic places to have worked. Well, there you go. If you if you're working in your uh, you know your cubicle, what you know can you really say that you've uh, that you've achieved <laughs> exactly. those sorts of memories? I don't think so. So yeah, exactly. You know, thanks so much, Darren, for being um, with us today on the, uh, the Right Work Life podcast. Uh, I just want to wish you all the best with uh, thanks, Hugo. Alex. Everybody, as I said, go over and uh, have a look at Hugo Team. I think it's a tool that you should have in your in your toolkit. I think it will make things a lot easier. So have a look. And Darren, we're going to keep in touch because I want to keep up to date with how Hugo is going. Definitely. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll speak to you soon, hopefully.